Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship again. It's good to be with you in person. Um, I am so thankful for those people that have been helping us do it online, but it obviously it's not the same. So I just want to say thank you to those who have helped out, and it's good to be with you again. Um, thank you for your flexibility as the governor's mandate changes weekly, it seems like, and um, just staying flexible as a congregation, as we are as a county as well. Um, a couple announcements. We have returned to Bible study, so please join us on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. Um, the messengers are out, and then we're still um, receiving donations for the summer lunch program, which I believe is actually ended, but we want to replenish their, the work that they did during the summer. They were feeding um, kids for any, any age at the Touch of Country all summer, um, and at a sort of reduced rate. Um, and just a way to uh, make sure they have meals when they can't be in school and are receiving those free and reduced lunch. Um, and just on a congregational note, um, many of you have got information on Nancy, who is still in the hospital. Um, just continued prayers for her. And that's the best thing that we can do right now. Um, she is appreciative of people reaching out, but just wishes that, as you saw in her Facebook post, that um, you don't reach out to her, at least um, on the phone, because she's trying to rest and recuperate, and she will be giving us updates. So I'm um, just continue to pray for her, and we'll do that in our prayers of the church as well. Um, any other announcements that I missed? We'll begin our service with the prelude. Sandy's going to do something on the piano for us this morning. I'm going to play a Bach prelude. Say that fast three times. <laughs> And uh, I think uh, there's some repetition in this, but uh, pray for our country, for your friends and neighbors, people in need, family members. So we invite you to worship with our faith.
I invite you to stand for our call to worship. We gather together to worship God, who comes to us when we least expect it, who calls us to trust in Him. In the midst of turbulent waves of our lives that crash down and overwhelm us, Jesus calls out to us again. Come, Come to Jesus. Jesus. We get so busy watching the waves that we block out Jesus' call. We get so busy looking at our limitations that we forget to have faith. Come, Come to Jesus. Jesus. Look again. Jesus is calling to you. Lord, help us to hear your voice that we may place our faith and trust in you. For you are the true Son of God and Savior of the world. Amen. Amen. We'll begin our service with our Kyrie, we'll see him in the instrument.
Sing our gathering hymn, Lord, keep us steadfast in your word. The second lesson for today is taken from Romans 10. 
Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law, that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you on your lips and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim, because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. I invite you to stand for our gospel affirmation that you'll find in your bulletin. Challenges and, and quirks, as we might say. 
But sleep is kind of one of those things that affects your whole day and even your whole week when, when you don't have it. Monday or Tuesday, it seemed like that night, um, Luke got up every couple hours wanting to eat. So we tried to put him down earlier, trying to navigate when's the best time to put him down, and then just 9 a.m. at 9 p.m. he got up. Then it was like 11.30 he got up, and 2, and so on and so on. And so as the night ends and you get up for the morning, you kind of wonder how much quality sleep you actually got that night. And as you're just kind of getting through the day on uh, lack of sleep with, with lots of coffee in your system, you may feel like you're just trying to keep your head above water, right? You can make it through the day. Or you could say during difficult seasons like lack of sleep, sometimes you're just trying to tread water. Maybe you're feeling like you're not making much progress. We've been doing this same thing every night. We're just treading water. Do you see a lot of metaphors of water yet so far in our service? In the overwhelming moments of our lives, we often use the metaphor of a storm, much like the disciples experience today, don't we? Life circumstances can feel like overpowering waves that shake us like the boat. It can be hard to see past our present circumstances, and we wonder if this storm will ever relent in our lives. So although we are far removed from the ancient world where our story takes place, the metaphor of water and weather is still very prevalent in our vocabulary today. For the ancient Israelites and their Near Eastern neighbors, they were located in a desert climate, so water became sort of synonymous for life. But when uncontrolled, it was also synonymous for death and darkness, even evil. I don't know if you were on uh, Facebook this week, but I posted this aerial view of the Sea of Galilee uh, as a drone went over the sea and, and surveyed the landscape. The Sea of Galilee, much like Nye or Livingston, can unexpectedly receive these forces of wind that, that shape the whole area as different temperatures clash together. And so it's with this backdrop of, of the metaphor of storms, but also the reality that on that sea it was well known that storms could come at any moment, that our story takes root today, that we come to today. Because I think it's clear that Matthew has more in mind for us this morning than just a rescue experience. Although how impressive rescue story that is, it's really going to, we're really going to see that it's going to show us two things within the text, within Matthew's Gospel. Our story is showing us, revealing to us, who Jesus is, that He is the Son of God, and we're, we're called to worship Him, like the disciples do at the end. And just like God in Genesis, He has authority over this untamable world. So it's showing us who Jesus is, and then secondly, because who Jesus is, it's going to show us who we can turn to in the times of our storms, our stormy experiences. As Paul will say in Romans, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, or sword? All these storm experiences. Shall that separate us from the love of Christ? No, he says, for we are more than conquerors in Christ. So let's jump into the text and we'll see this story within the storyline of Matthew's Gospel. The first thing that you would remember if you were hearing Matthew's Gospel read aloud, because Gospels were meant to be read aloud, is that we've already kind of had a story like this before. Do you remember any other stormy stories with Jesus? He's on the boat this time, but Jesus is asleep in Matthew chapter 8 as this another storm rages around the disciples. Matthew chapter 8, 24 says, And behold, there arose a great storm in the sea, so that the boat that the disciples were in were covered with waves. Very similar circumstance. But Jesus was asleep. And the disciples came below the deck and said to him, woke him up, saying, Save us, Lord, for we are going to drown. Save us. And listen to Jesus' response. He says, 
You of little faith, why are you so afraid? Haven't we heard that phrase already today? You of little faith. Then Jesus got up and rebuked the winds and the waves. His voice has authority over the wind and the waves. And the disciples were amazed and asked him, What kind of man is this that we're following? Who is this person? But notice that title there. What kind of man is this? Who is this person? Fast forward to chapter 14 of Matthew's Gospel, and I think that the disciples are in a very different place at this point. Chapter 8 was sort of early on in Jesus' ministry, but now they've been with Jesus for a while now. And they have heard him teach every day. They've seen him perform these miracles. And so we come to our stormy experience today. And the text says that Jesus has the disciples immediately get up and to go on a boat. Immediately after what, though? If you remember last week, we had the feeding of the 5,000, which I think will be a very important text to kind of understand what's happening in our story today as well. If you remember the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus is in this desolate place, and he's been ministering to the crowd all day, and it becomes night. And the disciples say, Jesus, send the crowd away. We don't have any food to feed all these people. And do you remember what Jesus says? He says, disciples, you feed them. You give them something to eat. So do we think that Jesus thought that they had some large amounts of buffet tables hiding somewhere in the back? Is Jesus oblivious to the fact that they only have these measly five loaves and two fish? Of course not. So what is Jesus doing here? Jesus is giving them an opportunity to put their faith in him. An opportunity to trust that Jesus can provide for the crowd. And he does, with leftovers. We see the same thing today. Jesus almost weirdly makes or compels, it's a strong word, compels the disciples to get up quickly after the feeding, and he puts them on the boat alone. It's very specific, alone, and Jesus stays without a boat, and he dismisses the crowd. But as evening arrives, a violent storm takes over the sea and comes upon the disciples in the boat. Even as some of them are seasoned fishermen, they must have been terrified. Jesus had saved them last time, but now they are alone. And they were fighting these tormenting waves all night, it says, or it says, in the early morning, which would have been 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., the disciples suddenly see this figure walking out to them on the water in the middle of the sea. Some of them said, it's a ghost, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus' first words say, in the midst of the storm, take heart, I am. Do not be afraid. Why can they take heart? Because I am is here. Do not be afraid. It's the divine name, as I said, echoing back to Moses, for God delivered Israel through the waters. Matthew is making it abundantly clear with our text that this man who has authority over the wind and the waves, who with his voice can quell the forces of darkness and evil, represented by the water here, but soon it will be demonic powers, is God in the flesh. God in the flesh is before them walking on the water. As you'll say in the beginning of the Gospel, it is Emmanuel, God with us. <coughs> Peter sees that it is Jesus, and he says, Jesus, command me to come out to you on the water. Peter really is a disciple who has a lot of highs and lows, doesn't he? I don't think I would have even thought to come out to Jesus in the water. And Jesus says, come to me, come. As Peter gingerly, I assume, steps out onto the water, he doesn't sink. But then Peter begins not to focus on Jesus, but then he starts to focus on the wind and the waves around him. And then he begins to sink. Lord, save me! And Jesus stretches out his hand and catches him and says, You of little faith, 
Why do you doubt? Why do you doubt? And they get into the boat, and the wind immediately stops. And the disciples on the boat worship him, saying, You certainly are the Son of God. Not who is this man, not who is this ghost. No, you are the Son of God, which would have been, you are the long awaited for Messiah, the Savior of the world. In just two chapters, this will progress even more as Jesus asked the disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they lift off uh, some names, and then he says, But who do you say that I am? Who am I to you? And it's Peter again who will say, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So you see, much like with the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus gave them another opportunity to, to express their faith, to grow in their faith in who Jesus is. By deliberately sending them out on their own, Jesus used this storm experience to instruct his disciples and to increase their faith so that they would truly believe in who he is and understand what he has come to do. And as you hear that story, with all the great imagery, with all the things happening in our lives today, hurricanes this week, a mass explosion in Beirut, a virus that has suddenly hit more at home for our congregation, and then think about our own human sin that often causes chaos and waves and destruction in our lives. We know all about the wind and the waves, don't we? We may feel like we've been battling them all night for a long time. And it becomes really easy to focus on those things, doesn't it? To fixate on them. Just like Peter, we may step out of faith, but then our eyes start to move from Jesus, and then we get drawn to the wind around us, the waves around us, and we start to sink. We may feel like we're drowning with all this bad news. But notice that Jesus doesn't tell Peter to come to him only after the storm has been calmed. In fact, it's only after they get into the boat that the storm is calm. But Jesus beckons Peter to come to him in the midst of the storms of our lives, telling him that he will keep him safe. Our lives are full of opportunities to put our faith and trust in Jesus. Because again after again, we realize that we can't do this on our own, can we? Because Jesus never promises that we won't experience those waves of life. Instead, he asks us to trust that he will deliver us through the storms of our lives. Beckoning us in each circumstance that we experience in our lives to come to him, to only come to him. Always keep our eyes on him. The focus in on that. But why? Because who he is. He truly is the Savior of the world. He does have authority over the destructive forces of our lives, including our own sin, which he claimed authority over on the cross. And so this text, this imagery, this, this notion of Peter walking out, trusting in faith, is for us this morning. In the midst of the wind and the waves of our lives, may we put our trust and faith in Jesus. Knowing that even when we do falter, even when we do sink, he will be there to catch us, to grab us by the hand. And together we proclaim, we proclaim in hope that Jesus will come again to fully bring his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. A kingdom where we see all are fed. And a kingdom where the chaos of our world is finally calm because of who Jesus is and the kingdom that he's brought. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand for our hymn of the day, Eternal Father, Strong to Save, and number 756.
us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered in the Mosque of God, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He is ascended to heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Gracious God, your spirit offers peace to our hurting hearts. We pray that you would heal the hurts of all those who are suffering and in need, especially those on our prayer list in our hearts this morning. We also lift up before you our nation and our world. As COVID cases rise, we feel the increased anxiety and fear. In this political season, we are divided when we should be coming together. We are hurting each other instead of seeking the best for our neighbor. Turn us back into your kingdom way. Lord, your mercy. Hear our prayer. Gracious God, your word has been sown in many places and many hearts. Your, kin your kingdom continues to multiply in our midst. That is why we pray for the missionaries and ministries of your church around the world. The Lutheran World Relief working to aid those in Beirut after the explosion. For our shared ministry here at Emmanuel. Inspire us into generous acts of compassion for each other and for our world. Lord, in your mercy. Creator God, we pray for our world. We pray for those who are lacking food and shelter right now. For those who are out of work or underemployed. For those who are putting their lives at risk in returning to work. We pray for our teachers and our students as schools plan for the fall. We pray for our farmers and ranchers that provide sustenance to our world in need. Lord, in your mercy. And hear our prayer. Abiding and ever-present God, care for all those in the midst of the storms of this life. For those who are doubting, we pray that you would renew their faith. For those who are worrying, provide release. For those who are struggling, ease their burdens. For those who fear, give them hope. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Rejoicing in hope, we lift up the prayers of our hearts to you, most gracious Lord, trusting that you have received all our prayers and care. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. And also with you. We'll continue with our offering song. We give thee but thine own, you may be seated. Um, hymn number 686, verses 1 and 4. <laughs>
to his disciples saying, Taken, this is my body given for you. Do this meal in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, in the same way, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to all, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this also in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup together, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to stand. Now it looks like I didn't include the post communion prayer. So we'll go straight to the benediction. Hear these words from Paul. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor life, nor death, nor anything in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God, the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Amen. We sing our sending hymn of my peace like a river.
five, you can sure all safe. Go in peace, Christ is with you. Thank you, God.